Hi. Hi, this is Stephanie Skinner from Culture Media and welcome to Counterculture. Today's presentation comes to us from Ambrosi USA. As you will learn, Ambrosi is a storied company with a long dedication to the finest tradition uh, in, with, in Italian cheeses. Made in Italy and imported by Ambrosi. This means Ambrosi is not just a cheesemaker or an import exporter, they are both. And that commitment to production that has their name on it is what distinguishes Ambrosi. We will be hearing from Luigi Ambrosi, grandson of, grandson of the founder who runs Ambrosi's USA division. And we will also hear from Zach Pass, who has been in the world of cheese for more than a decade. And of course, we'll taste some cheese. Before we get started, I wanna mention a few housekeeping notes as I always do. This presentation should be in speaker view mode automatically, but if not, please put it in speaker view. There is a Q&A button on either the top or the side of your screen. Please post questions and comments there. I will be reviewing them as we go along and I will ask them to the presenters as appropriate. We will also have a Q&A period at the end of the presentation, but if we don't get to your questions today, they will respond to you directly afterwards. You can also use the chat function, which I will also monitor. And we really, really love to hear from you. We love your participation, your thoughts, your, your whatever you wanna tell us. Tell us your pairing suggestions, recipes, favorite cheese moments, etc. And all questions are good questions. So please ask. So let's get started. Here are Luigi, Luigi and Zach. Thank Hello, you, everyone. Stephanie. Awesome. Um, well, thanks for joining us, everyone. We can't see you, but we know you're there. Um, now we're just trying to see where the presentation is. There we go. Awesome. Um, Luigi, you want to give it a whirl? So hello everyone, I'm, I'm Luigi Ambrosi, uh, uh, third generation uh, of uh, the Ambrosi family uh, working uh, with Ambrosi USA in, in New York. Uh, just to give a little bit of a history about our family, about our company, we, um, Ambrosi was founded in 1942 by my grandfather, Ottorino. It started as a butter production in Brescia, which is a town in north of Italy between Verona and Milan, more or less. and over the years, it sort of developed uh, um, more and more. And in the 1960s, in fact, the main activity of Ambrosi became, on top of butter production, it actually became the aging and distribution of Grana Padano and Parmigiano Reggiano. Um, and, you know, Ambrosi has always been known for being at the forefront of innovation, both uh, technological and uh, and uh, um, strategical. And in fact, in the 1970s, we were already on top of the rising trend of the supermarket and were one of the first companies uh, to invest in the consumer uh, packaging of our, of our products uh, for the, uh, to make them optimal for the retail market. Uh, and, and that is something that we really strive to do today as well. We try to maintain our traditionality and our artisanal methods while um, Improving, uh, improving and innovating to uh, best serve our customers and consumers. Um, a quick note about our founder, Torino Ambrosi, uh, and giving you a little bit of a background about our logo, actually. Uh, as you can see, our little prancing horse, it's because um, when Ottorino came, Ottorino uh, started a company when he came back from the war, World War II, where he was a decorated aviator and he, as a sign of, of, of uh, as a thank you from the army, he was granted the permission to use the logo from his squadron of, uh, that he was so such decorated in, in order to bring good luck to his future endeavors. Uh, so that we're very proud about that. Um, fast forwarding to the 2000s. Uh, I don't know if the presentation yeah, Mara, yeah. is lagging a little bit, but um, so yeah. Okay, so in the 1990s, actually, the, we, we built our current age quarter uh, in Castanedolo, where we moved all our production of Grana Padano and all our main activities. And in 1994, Giuseppe Ambrosi, our current group president, 
he 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 became the president and started launching this uh, international growth strategy, which we very much believe in today. And in fact, the 2000s have been um, characterized by a large uh, international growth, uh, you know, fueled by the acquisitions of different sub different subsidiaries in France, in the UK, and in the USA. As you know, us Ambrosi Food USA was created in 2006, and in 2013 we actually established our roots physically uh, in Brooklyn, uh, in our what we call the Millennial Brooklyn Outpost, um, and and so that's that's where we are today. In 2010, actually, we um, we bought Bertozzi, which is a historical uh, Parmigiano uh, producing uh, Parmigiano Reggiano producing company in the heart of Parma. Uh, as well as the Traversetto Lese Creamery, where we make our very special, extraordinary Parmigiano Reggiano, the white gold, which we will touch upon a little later. Um, yeah, so here we are today, Ambrosi Food USA. We've, we're very proud of what we're doing. We have a, an amazing air program uh, for our fresh cheeses. We launched in 2019 a new brand uh, called the Ambrosi Millennials, which is over 30 uh, PDO and traditional specialty cheeses. Uh, cut and wrap in fixed weight format, perfect for the retail and for our uh, consumers that are avid to learn and be educated about what they are eating. Uh, so this is a little bit our story and uh, we're, we're very happy to go into a little bit more detail about who is Ambrosia and what we do. So. so this is a slide kind of, you know, representing a, a lot of the different cheeses that um, we have under our umbrella. And again, um, we're predominantly, um, well, we produce the largest, you know, the highest percentage of what we do is in Grana and uh, Reggiano, uh, Parmesan Reggiano. Um, although um, we're also producing a wide variety of other hard cheeses, um, as well as some uh, semi-soft cheeses. So again, you know, um, Luigi started touching a bit on our millennial uh, line, and this is, was kind of our first opportunity um, to really kind of create an exact way program similar to what we were doing in Italy, but that kind of covers the vast majority of all the cheeses that we have under our umbrella. They're smaller sizes, so six to seven ounces. Um, also kind of small um, case packs. Um, you know, again, what our intentions are is to be able to provide anybody the ability to taste everything from the commodities to also the specialty uh, driven cheeses um, in our portfolio for a really nice affordable price. Um, but again, everything that we're producing um, and everything that we're putting under our millennial brand are all DOP cheeses. So controlled and um, also kind of defines the tradition of the category. Next slide. Air program, you know, so this is a, just a, a little si slide um, kind of discussing the specific um, partners of ours that we're doing an air program with. An air program for us has been really important. Um, one, to be able to get cheese uh, to land here in the country with an extended shelf life or as much of a shelf life as possible, specifically for some of our fresher cheeses. Um, Marinchino is a um, partner of ours that's doing um, mixed blended cheeses. So sheep, goats, and cow, um, all soft ripened cheeses. Casa Argoni is um, our partner that is producing all of our Telegio and Gorgonzola. Um, and uh, we're gonna get a little bit more into those cheeses today because you guys are gonna be sampling. Um, Campania Felix is our partner um, producing all of our uh, Bufla mozzarella um, as well as burrata and so forth. So the cool thing for us is, well, pre-pandemic, we were doing our air program every week. Right now we're doing it every two weeks, but um, we're starting to see things open up and it's allowing us to probably be able to go back to a weekly. Um, but typically um, on that weekly scenario is you're able to kind of place orders Monday through Thursday um, and receive the cheese the following week, which is great. 
um, it comes right into uh, New Jersey and we're able to ship it out to our customers. It's awesome. Next slide. Okay, so now we get to start getting into the fun part. Um, okay, you guys were all uh, sent a bunch of cheese. Um, we're gonna feel free to start kind of <laughs> nibbling on a lot of the stuff. Um, white gold is where we'll start. Um, but then as we kind of go more into the presentation, there's going to be uh, another area where we're gonna taste um, the white gold up against grana, but feel free to start enjoying the white gold right now. White gold is a really special cheese for us. You know, we've been in um, the Parm and grana business for, for a while. Um, you know, for us, it kind of started turning into a little bit more of a, a commodity-based um, category, specifically uh, Reggiano. Um, we really wanted to create something that kind of could add uh, the next level um, and have our product kind of stand apart. This is an example for us that um, it's also kind of farm to table. You know, we control uh, the farm, the creamery, the aging, um, all steps of it is ours. Um, and that's a special scenario as well as we started playing around with the um, with the diet of of the cows. Luigi, do you want to? Yeah. So yeah, we have been you know we set out really on a mission with the white gold to create something unique and as I mentioned before, extraordinary. We like to call it extraordinary Parmigiano Reggiano because we sort of started adding um, flax seeds to the diet of the cow to make the milk. Uh, to impart to the milk certain characteristics that make it uh, a little, that translate it into the cheese, into a little more buttery notes and a little sweeter notes um, while preserving the intensity of the aroma of a 24 month aged Parmigiano Reggiano. And we decided to have a very controlled um, production process uh, and make this cheese in a very in a small batch format. We only produce 20,000 wheels a year. And we do have a lot of requests for it and which is why we really we want to work with the people that want to help us champion this cheese and champion this practice of making parmigiano reggiano in a very sustainable and a very controlled and a very uh, careful way um you know we could almost say we were a bit inspired by the kobe beef uh, techniques of uh, treating the the animal in a more humane way uh, but uh, so we're very we're very uh, sort of happy with the results that we have um, uh, reached so far. There's always uh, improvements. We're constantly, you know, getting feedback and uh, and finding out ways in which we can make this an even always uh, better product. You know, and and again, it's if we want to kind of maybe is there the next slide. Um, so this slides a, a also a little bit, um, you know, as far as helping you guys with, uh, different pairings and so forth, but the nature of the cheese has been pretty interesting, you know, by introducing the flaxseed to the cow's diet and taking it. So again, we're not releasing this cheese to anyone, to anyone prior, uh, a minimum of 24 months. And typically when you get a 24 month um, piece of Reggiano, it's going to be uh, pretty kind of like a, a nice yellow uh, hue color to it, very full of kind of crystallization um, when you're biting into it. But at the same time, kind of, you know, the, the older you get, the more intense um, a lot of the flavors get. Um, also specifically um, salt, the, you know, the flavor of the salt kind of becomes a little bit more, um, more apparent. The really interesting thing with white gold is when we're releasing it, one, when you're cracking it open, the wheel, the inside of the cheese, the pulp of the cheese has remained on the, pretty much on the whiter side. Um, that's where we're getting the name from. Um, you still have the crystallization, which is awesome, um, but we've got a lot of creaminess um, and fat complexity um, to the cheese. So for us, 
you know, it can be used for sure as a cheese to grate and to, um, you know, uh, flake up, but it's also awesome cheese for just like a, a real table cheese. Um, you know, because the, the, the salt is not quite there as it is on a typical piece of 24 month, um, it's just a really nice balanced flavor. Um, yeah. Luigi, do you want to yeah, add anything? Not, yeah, you know, it's not just about the um, Parmigiano, Reggiano being an ingredient. This really the way in which it really is also supposed to be eating in in large hearty chunks and really being yeah. able to bite into all the aromas and all the different textures that this amazing cheese has to offer, uh, the white gold. Uh, also, we, we decided to put uh, a stamp, as you could see on the wheel, uh, the wheel uh, rind has a, quite a unique stamp that you might have not seen before, which is the winged victory, which is the symbol of the town of Traversetolo. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's also a, a beautiful story behind that, that um, when, when there was a retaliation of the soldiers during World War II, they were passing through every town, taking hostages, killing everyone. But in Traversetolo, when they passed, everyone sort of hid inside the church uh, with a few provisions, including uh, Parmigiano Reggiano. And when they came out of the church, or when, and they all survived uh, this retaliation, they saw this beautiful wing victory and decided that the products of the town should bury the good luck charm of Traversetolo, which is uh, this, this, this unique uh, symbol. And we sort of wanted to honor the city in that. And uh, that's the, the logo of our criminal. Um, so we're gonna get into, in a few more slides down, we'll get into kind of the characteristics. If you can go right back though, Monica, um, we'll talk a little bit about what defines the, the DOP. Um, but again, um, white gold, just to kind of sum up, um, one farm, and again, the, we, not again, but to tell you the breed of cows that we're using, um, it's, it's, you know, it's the Italian equivalent of a Holstein, um, Friesian. Um, so again, so one farm with one herd, um, all natural, um, and then uh, one creamery. Uh, producing and taking in all of the milk and uh, a dedicated aging facility for the white gold. And that pretty much sums up, you know, I mean, again, for us, it was really about showing an example of what we can do farm to table and everything can be traced back to um, the cows that were producing the milk on that specific day to produce that wheel of cheese. Pretty awesome thing. Whereas a lot of Parm uh, or Reggiano that we consume in this country, um, it's really hard to do that. It's very hard to trace it back to where it actually came from. It's easy to trace it back to the facility where the cheese was aged. Um, that's usually represented as far as um, a, a seal on the cheese called the Casaficio and that has the plant number on it. Um, but prior that, uh, it's hard to figure out all the time. All right, next slide. Uh, all right, Luigi's gonna help me here as well. Um, but Casa Argoni is uh, the producer of the other, um, well, not the other, but you've got a piece of Telegio in front of you, or you should, and you should also have a piece of our Gorgonzola Dolce. Um, both of these examples that you guys have are um, made, it's something a little bit new for us right now. It's, uh, they're made with 100% um, certified USDA uh, milk. Casa Argoni um, has for a long time um, been working in bio, uh, which is the European equivalent to um, organic. Uh, and then over the past few years, they've worked really hard to um, set aside um, and create um, practices in their facilities to produce a USDA organic. And they are first onto the market um, a little bit uh, towards the middle of last year. Um, Luigi developed the label um, for kind of launching into this year. Um, you know, again, 
we have a, 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 a little bit larger of a line um, for the USDA organics where we do have a, a, a Reggiano in both a wedge and um, some flakes and grated cups. Um, but we really wanted to share with you the Telegio and the Gorgonzola today. Um, why don't we, Luigi, do you want to talk a little bit about the uniqueness of Casargoni? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I would say that that's also a great example of uh, what, I, what we were talking about earlier about traditionality meets innovation, because these are two very traditional uh, uh, products of Italy that really shape the history of Italy in a way, the culinary history. And, you know, typically they have not been made with organic milk. And in this sort of what we like to do is we like to be forward looking while preserving these traditional aspects. Uh, and and that, that is something that we always strive to do. Uh, Casarigone itself is a very um, traditional company. It's based in the heart of Valtaleggio, which is in these beautiful hills. And, you know, that's where they have their aging, uh, their aging caves. And they source their milk from alpine brown cows that, that is... Uh, and they may and they produce the actual all the cheese in in sort of in a farmstead context context you know so the milk is uh, the, the the cows are milked on the premise where the cheese is actually also made uh so really um that's that's what we call the farmstead and casarigoni has a lot of uh different types of products you know they have goat milk cheeses as well uh, uh which they sort of i mean i would say that their main Hero product are Taleggio and Gorgonzola, but from there they decided to sort of uh, venture a little bit into innovations. So they made a goat milk a Gorgonzola or a, a truffle, uh, a Gorgonzola with truffle flakes. Um, they have, you know, uh, sorry, a Taleggio with the truffle flakes, and they have also a Gorgonzola, spoonable Gorgonzola, which is extra creamy and great to spread on 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 bread. Um, we they also have a, a line of roccolino cheeses which is sort of this beautiful little um little uh, little wheel of cheese cheese is kind of right in the center of the of yeah. that page kind of towards the uh, towards the bottom exactly and they have a they have the original roccolino as well as one rubbed with mediterranean herbs the other one you know dipped in balsamic vinegar another one with red wine uh from the north of italy uh, so, you know, they're very inventive with uh, traditional artisanal cheeses. Uh, and, you know, what's very sort of uh, important about this, this company that we should mention is that they're really a, a company of affineurs. That is really their, their main expertise is they have these amazing ways of refining the cheeses and of aging the cheeses and, you know, uh, they of course you know of course they, they they did try to recreate the ancient cave uh um context and and uh, in their in their aging facility you know the humidity and the temperature etc as well as you know aging everything in original pine wood cases wrapping it in cheese clothes washing so for example taleg is called the washed rind cheese because it gets every day they wash the rind with water and salt in order to make sure that there's no uh, unnecessary bacteria, let's say that that develops, so they're very well. well you know, and it, and it also, you know, the washing of the rind is also kind of what helps it develop the orange hue. You know, so the orange hue is another bacteria, B. linen, that kind of adheses itself to uh, the surface of the cheese and causes the cheese to turn orange. And typically. B linens are really only around um, kind of moist, colder um, temperatures. So, like by having those cheeses age in the caves, it's 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 a perfect place for it. Um, so I went there two years ago, and it was a really really cool operation. Um, you know, a, a lot of hand washing going on. Everything's done by hand. Um, it's literally. Uh, like, you know, the process hasn't changed in a long time. It's awesome. Um, brown cows that are being used um, for uh, these cheeses. Um, and, you know, again, for the Telegio, they're being aged in those caves for a total 
around 50 days um, and during the course. And then again, as Luigi mentioned, they're being washed uh, on a regular basis with just water and salt, sea salt. Yeah, and another thing that I would say that is interesting, you know, uh, Catherine Goni is a close partner of ours and in the US, they decided to join uh, Ambrose in this mission of uh, bringing this very specialty uh, uh, artisanal uh, cheeses that may not be widely known as, you know, uh, Grana and Parmigiano and, you know, uh, the, the standard Taleggio. Uh, and, and thereby doing this, we are really not only saving uh, these cheeses from a, almost, I would say, extinction because we're revitalizing them and giving them a new life, a new sort of consumer base and, and making them a little bit uh, more popular. And also, I would say, enhancing the life of, of, of the great people that are, have the chance to eat them. Uh, and we're also keeping a community of producers alive that has been doing, uh, has been carrying forward this process in Valtaleggio since, uh, you know, centuries. So I think it's a very noble mission that we're doing here in the U.S. together with uh, with uh, Casa Rigoni. And I'm, I'm very proud of it. And I love eating it. I hope you guys are enjoying it too right now. All right, next slide. Okay, so here's a, a little bit of um, a nice comparison, you know, that we can start kind of doing when you guys are sitting at home tasting. Um, you know, the big differences, you know, between the Granas uh, and the Reggianos of the world, mainly um, just also, you know, it starts with the milk. Um, typically, uh, Grana uh, and Luigi, you can help me out here, but same cows uh, for the most part. Um, grana production um, is done kind of uh, in the lower flat pastures and um, a lot of Reggiano production as far as the milk is concerned is coming and sourced from cows that are kind of a little bit more up on the hills and sometimes up um, being sourced around the mountainous areas. Um, so again, um, as they're going up the hills, the vegetation also changes a lot. Um, but typically the main difference here between uh, the two cheeses is grana's gonna be made with skimmed milk um, to where they separate the fa. Um, and Reggiano um, is made with raw milk and whole milk. Um, so we're really keeping uh, the fat and the complexity of all those flavors within the cheese. So, you know, the real interesting thing there is typically Reggiano's, we age out longer than, uh, uh, you know, than a grana. Um, for Reggiano, you're looking at a minimum of 14 months. Um, for grana, uh, it's a minimum of 11 months before we release. Anything else, Luigi, you wanna add? Yeah. I mean, I would say that uh, one, uh, one way to really spot the difference that many people don't know, uh, of course, us in the industry, most of us, we know, but, you know, when you buy a wedge, even of, uh, when you look at a wedge of Grana and Parmigiano, if you look at the rind, uh, you can see that on Parmigiano, there is printed uh, Parmigiano Reggiano, and on the Grana Padano, you have the Grana Padano logo. So, because I, we do realize that they can, have a, at first a pretty similar look, but the little trick is to look at the rind to understand which, to distinguish which is from which. And then of course, when you taste it, you will most likely taste the difference. One, Parmigiana uh, grana is a little milder and, and more, more, more delicate sweet, whereas uh, Parmigiano is more aromatic and, and, and intense with hints of walnuts and, uh, and a herbal sort of fragrance. That herbal fragrance definitely comes from the grass grass diet, exclusively grass-fed diet that um, they have. And one commonality uh, be, between Parmigian and Grana that not many people know about is that they are actually lactose-free um, cheeses, uh, both of them. The lactose is naturally disappears during the aging process. Uh, and so, you know, they're a great option for people that are have intolerances and uh, or that maybe you know prefer to cut down on, on, on that type of nutrient um, 
So that's that's something to to, to keep in mind. We added a few slides here, and again, I, I believe you guys will all be able to um, get a copy of the presentation, but I, I felt like everybody kind of should get a little bit of the base of, you know, the defining characteristics of the DOP for these cheeses. So grana, again, coming from a specific area that's highlighted on the slide, um, and then uh, Parmigiano Reggiano, um, coming from another specific region close by. Um, hmm. and this is uh, what's highlighted in this slide. And again, I think guys, everybody's kind of getting into some questions, but we totally will have a question and answer um, scenario at the end. Um, this slide's again, kind of talking about the DOP for Grana, uh, uh, Grana uh, Gorgonzola on the left and uh, Telagio on the left. What do we do next slide? You know, we wanted to kind of, I wanted to really talk about um, the USDA organics that you've got, that you guys are, are tasting. Um, you know, a lot of the cheeses or you know, it's, it's been a movement here in this country for a while now, and they've become a lot more popular. Um, again, going through the process of um, certifying your products, USDA is not an easy uh, task at all, even for us here in this country, um, but even uh, a tougher uh, thing to ask of our farmers in Italy. You know, typically the big thing um, defining between the difference between a, a bio program in, in Europe uh, versus a USDA program here um, or a USDA program in general is um, the real big factor of it is, is it is an animal that does get sick and you do want to give it antibiotics. Um, with the bio program, you can you can give that animal antibiotics. You have to remove that animal from the herd. Um, and once the animal has gotten better and the antibiotics are out of the animal system, you can reintroduce it to the herd. Um, USDA certified organic, you cannot reintroduce that animal. It can never come back into the herd. Um, and you know, typically there's a lot of else that we can get into it, but you know, that's a big defining um, scenario in which a lot of farmers have decided to not go into USDA. One, there's a limited amount of space. There's not a lot of farmers, period, um, in either of these regions that we're talking about. Um, there's not a lot of cows. Um, so the, just the, the, the simple characteristic of what to do when an animal gets sick is it's a, it's a, it's, it's a tough one. Um, so a lot of people have chosen, a lot of farmers have chosen to not even do it. Um, we've felt that it's, um, you know, again, it's kind of an innovation for us and something that can help us stand apart. Um, and it also, you know, goes towards animal um, welfare that we're really into and want to promote. Um, so it's a line that we're getting really behind. Um, the Telegio and the Gorgonzola, um, right now, Casa Aragoni, we're the only manufacturers of these two cheeses in a USDA um, certified example. Um, Reggiano, there are a few others, but it's still very hard to find in this country. Luigi? Yeah. yeah, and I would say that, uh, you know, this USDA organic campaign is part of a larger uh, picture of sustainability focus that Ambrosi has been uh, mm -hmm. has. And, you know, Ambrosia has been working towards its sustainable goals for years now, and we are uh, achieving great results. Uh, you know, we have been working on the reduction of waste and plastic usage, meaning the plastic, that, the percentage of plastic that we use in our packaging. We've done great improvements in that. We are reducing uh, CO2 emissions. And actually, there was a, a newspaper article today in Italy about our, our achievement that uh, highlighted 
uh, how we are on the way by the end of 2022, we're going to be able to produce all our energy and electricity. Uh, half of it, we're going to be able to produce it uh, from our photovoltaic panels and co-generator technologies that we have installed. Um, so that's, you know, we are very, and constantly we're looking for ways in order to promote sustainability, make our company more sustainable, and also uh, improving our, the traceability of our products and, and, and of our farms. So that's, stay tuned for ever more updates uh, of, on our projects. For the pieces of cheese, um, as far as the gorgonzola dolce, I mean, you know, we age it for about 60 days. Um, this cheese, obviously, not obviously, but I'll teach you a little Italian. Dolce is cream, um, and it's on the creamier side versus our picante, which is um, a little bit, um, well, not as uh, creamy. We age it a little bit longer for about 90 days. Um, the Telegio, uh, again, this is going to be on the younger side of the Telegio, meaning it just came over. Um, but as that cheese um, gets a little bit closer to uh, code, it, it gets a little bit creamier, um, also gets a little bit uh, funkier in smell. Um, but the flavor is really nice and caramelly. Um, actually, we can start maybe going into the next slide. Um, so we've done a few things. We we're, I think everybody that is here will also get a link to a cookbook that we put together with the help of our culture friends. So enjoy. Um, but Luigi's actually done a lot of work here to kind of show you a few examples of some traditional usages of the cheese, as well as um, <laughs> some usages that he uh, came in contact with when he came to this country. So, <laughs> for... Yeah, uh, so I would say that I wanted to, as, as an overview in this, in this presentation, I just wanted to show Uh oh, he froze up for two secs. Corn. This is a great snack, very easy to make. Not many people realize that it's something you could do. You just take the, the rind of Parmigiano Reggiano, throw it in the microwave for a few minutes, and uh, that's pretty much it. It's simple and delicious, and definitely healthier than many snacks that we may be eating while, while watching our favorite TV show or something. Uh, Not quite as healthy as popcorn, but yeah, you know, but more tasty, I would say. Uh, a lot tastier. <laughs> correct. Then we have a little in the middle here. We have a little more gourmet recipe. Uh, the Mister A Gnocchi. Uh, it's it's from a famous restaurant in Italy, and they utilize eight different types of cheeses in making their gnocchi sauce, range from Taleggio to Asiago to Montasio, Fontina uh, and whatnot. And it's, it's a really, truly delicious sauce uh, that I definitely recommend. So I definitely recommend to not be afraid. This is to say to not be afraid to throw different cheeses together in the mix, uh, you know, because you might be surprised with what a delicious combina cheesy combination you might get. And then sort of uh, the um, ESJB, the gnocchi, sounds phenomenal. It is phenomenal. Uh, Taleggio grilled cheese sandwich, I would say, is something that, you know, when I came to the U.S., uh, you know, I discovered this, this grilled cheese sandwich culture, which is, I guess, one of the most uh, popular, uh, uh, you know, plates, especially for college students. When I was a college student here, that's, that was a popular option for my peers. And I thought, you know, why, why can it not be elevated, the, cheese, the grilled cheese experience? Why does it need to always use this uh, kind of bland uh, uh, slice, cheese slice uh, that, you know, um, that you might even use in a hamburger or whatever. So we tried experimenting with different ones and I'm happy to see that I was not the only one that caught on the trend, but making a grilled cheese with taleggio, which has a great melting, uh, uh, is, is great for melting, uh, is really elevates the experience to the next level and, and can really be a surprising treat 
uh, to make and, and simple again. You know, I know that we're all about convenience as well as quality. So that's uh, something that I recommend. I mean, it really, I mean, the mustard in there is, is awesome. Yeah. Um, totally compliments one another. So this is kind of, you know, again, I saw the list of everybody that's joining and you guys are all coming with a lot of knowledge, but, you know, kind of starting from the Reggiano on the, on the far left, that's our white gold, you know, as far as wines are concerned, Sangiovese, um, that's on, you know, maybe on the lighter side, but you can also pair it. It goes really good with bubbles. Um, we put a French Accorta. Uh, there's a little bit for, um, you know, grana as well. Um, but the honey uh, and, and, and a little bit of chocolate, you know, chocolate is awesome. Telegio, I mean, wash rinds in general, but Telegio, it's like my favorite cheese to eat with beer, um, period. And then like the more tasty of the beer, even getting into like a porter, it's, it's, it's an awesome combination. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's interesting for the Gorgonzola. So typically when one is wanting to make a, a salad or whatnot, you might take the picante because it's a little bit easier to crumble. Um, but the gorgonzola, the dolce, and even the spoonable uh, formats for me are like my favorites. And I'm just, you know, a straight spreader on bread and that, that's all I need. What do you think, Luigi? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree, you know, and it's always great to experiment and learn new things. Uh, this is something yeah. that we have tested and we can, we can back <laughs> what we're saying here is something that we definitely recommend. Uh, I remember even, you know, um, you know, yeah, again, something that many people don't know is Parmigiano or Reggiano with chocolate and especially the white gold with chocolate. It's something that, especially when uh, I have friends coming over to my house, they always call me up asking if there's some white gold and they proceed, if I say yes, they proceed to say, okay, we're gonna bring the chocolate dip and we're gonna get dip in. Uh, and that, that, that's something that we often do. So uh, that's, I, 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 I welcome you to try it. <laughs> I like it. I mean, you know, I mean, the craziest for me was, you know, a few years ago having my first wash rind cheese in a, you know, uh, grilled cheese was, and, and or just on top of sandwiches. And I've just, I've continued to use that as an ingredient to just kind of heighten any, um, sandwich slash grilled cheese melting situation. Mm. Um, do we have any more slides? I think we're getting down to the last. Now we can start getting into your questions. I've been seeing a lot of questions pop up, but getting through the, uh, the presentation, thank you for allowing us to do that. Yes. So, uh, hi, this is Stephanie, I'm gonna-, I'm gonna Toss in a couple of questions for you. Um, does anyone produce a certified organic parm? Well, I mean, so we do. So we, we do, um, we have, and we're bringing into the country right now, um, a certified USDA uh, Reggiano. We're doing it in two formats. We're bringing in an 18 month. Um, that's in our retail format. So you'll see that in our seven ounce wedge. And that's, that was kind of highlighted in that picture um, from one of the previous slides. Um, but we're also bringing in full wheels and quarter wheels of 24 month. Um, they are available now. And if you guys out there want them, we got them. Um, so yeah, you know, there's, it, it, it's really interesting. They're really, from what I've been learning, there's really only five farms right now in the region that are producing or able to produce um, a USDA uh, program. And uh, it's one creamery, we're, per we're pretty much working and, pur and purchasing all of their cheese. Um, so it is hard to find in this country, but we're bringing it in. Awesome. Um, 
Is the same type of culture used for both Grana, Padano, and Parmigiano Reggiano? Um, I would say, if, if I can answer that, Zach, I would say uh, no, because that's actually uh, the particularity of, of the production process of the cheese and also stemming from the region in which the cheese is produced. Each, um, and actually not just Parmigiano from Grana, but every different Parmigiano and every different Grana have slightly different, uh, what's called the microflora, which is the bacterial component uh, in, in the milk uh, that is used to make that specific uh, product. So no, <laughs> this is the answer to that. Mm. Um, both are made. Both are made with animal rennet. Yes, um, and that's the tradition. So, no microbials, no vegetable, and mm -hmm. pretty much the majority of all of the DOPs are using an animal rennet yeah, from cows. Do you make a, does Ambrosi make a separate line of unpasteurized cheese for Italy? Is there, for example, is there a raw milk telegio that you sell in? In, uh, we sell it. We sell the raw milk telegio here. Um, we're bringing it in after um, it's it's deemed okay to do. Um, we have it available. Um, again, you know, a lot of what we do are all not a lot. Everything that we do is a DOP base. Okay, so it's how the cheeses were also intended, um, but. So a lot of our cheeses are raw milk, but have, you know, have just gotten to the age. Um, but for our semi-soft and our, um, you know, and our, some of our fresh cheeses, we, we are. And there are, some of them are available here. Um, as I suspected, there's a lot of interest in the, the comparison between grana and um, parm. And uh, if you don't mind us covering your faces again for a second, we we have a request from Sarah that she'd like to look at the slide for, for um, the comparison of Grana to Parm again. I'm sure you want to cover my face the whole time. I so know, sure. we don't, we don't. We, I miss you, Zach. <laughs> so, you know, uh, uh, again, I think the, we were kind of going through this slide quickly, but Grana, um, as far as diet is concerned, um, silage is used. So a mixture of hay and corn, um, as well as the animals foraging um, out in pasture. Uh, Reggiano, um, exclusively uh, grass, um, although with our white gold, we're introducing the flaxseed. Um, yeah. And Go ahead. If I can add something, uh, which is sort of something that I saw being the next Q&A, uh, another question that is present in the Q&A, there is a slight difference in ingredients in uh, the Grana Padano and Parmigiano Reggiano, which uh, for Grana Padano, we also use lysosome in the production, uh, which is that egg yeah. white a point that yeah. someone asked about. And what it really is, that is connected to the fact that the cows are fed the silage because uh, there might be, and this is by the way, this is what is really the fascinating part about being a cheese producer because really the, 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 the master cheese maker are true alchemists, I would say in what they do and they never cease to amaze me. They, so because the cows that, um, uh, that make the milk for grana eat the silage, there might be certain uh, bacteria that develop in these hay and corn uh, mixture uh, be because of how it's stored in these big bowls. You might have seen if you've been to Italy or if you've you know, maybe seen pictures of these big bowls of, 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 of silage. And um, because to counter the possibility of the presence of those uh, bacteria, uh, we have, well, the, the master cheese makers have figured out a way in which to use the pro protein from lysosome uh, and, and insert it in the milk. Uh, in order to make sure that everything uh, is, is, goes according to plans. And uh, the other thing that I would say to not be scared about lysosome, which is this very scientific term, because it's something that it's not just present in egg white, it's actually present in large quantities in human saliva, in tears, 
and, and breast milk. So, uh, you know, something that we all have already in our body. Uh, so it's definitely not something bad. Uh, and actually in the, in the production of Grana Padano, there is a very little quantity of it being used. So um, no, no need to worry there. <laughs> That's what I would say. Great. I think we could probably- really good That was a good question. It was an excellent question. Give you an opportunity to talk about lysosome. So that's awesome. So I think we can probably just bring their faces back up again, Monica. Awesome. Um, so uh, I don't know if you all saw, but uh, I believe JB or somebody put in um, the chat how you can find out how to trace uh, a wheel of Parmigiano Reggiano, which is um, which is interesting. So, so this is the interesting one, and I, you know, neither of us. Uh, well, Luigi's pretty, really good at it, but without kind of looking at the numbers, the, those, the, the labeling on both um, master cases that our cheese comes in um, and or on our exact weights, um, the back labels um, refer to a batch, okay? And the batch um, also within that number um, refers to um, where it's coming from. So we can trace it back um, to where the cheese was aged um, and the batch it came from. Um, it's not uh, telling you information as far as from which farm or farms it's coming from. Um, and just, you know, just kind of like an overview of production in general um, for Grana and Reggiano. Um, the milk is coming in for, so for every creamery that we're working with and, you know, for Grana, we're working with three different creameries um, and around, I believe, what, four or five for Reggiano. Uh, regardless, those creameries are bringing milk in from a variety of, of local farms. Um, so when they're producing, um, you know, it, it's, it's really kind of more typical of sourcing it back to where the cheese was aged. Great. Um, I'm actually posting, I'm, I'm, I'm told that it was posted in Q&A, so I'm posting it in chat so that other people can see what the link. I have a question. By adding the flax um, to, their, to the cow's feed, does that in any way um, sort of, does it knock you off the DOP? Because I thought it was very specified what they were allowed to eat. No, it does not. No, it does not. Uh, it is still very, very much DOP. Uh, the flax seed are can be considered a type of forage uh, under the under the um, uh, DOP specification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and, and how on earth did you come up with that? It's amazing. <laughs> it's fascinating. Testing and inventiveness and fantasy and desire to make <laughs> Okay, is lysosome uh, lysosome is common on Manchego? Also, that's a question. I'm not sure if you guys would know the answer to that one. I'm not going to know the answer for that one. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh huh. Manchego, Manchego. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so are all of your cheeses sold in the USA or are they just the millennial, is it mostly the millennial brand at this point? No, we've got, uh, listen, we do a, a wide variety of age cheeses and I'll kind of go through it with you folks. We do obviously our white gold where we're bringing in full forms, um, whole wheels, eighths and quarters. We also do different sizes of exact weights. Um, we, for Origiano, um, whole wheels, quarters, ace wedges, we are doing, we're bringing in 30 month, 24 month, 18 month, 14 month. Um, we didn't really dibble dabble on this, but we also bring in different versions of um, Reggiano, where we have a mountain where all of the milk is being sourced from mountain farms and creameries. Um, we are doing a brown cow where um, that cheese is made specifically with only 
uh, milk coming from uh, brown cow farms. Um, mm. We also bring in a little bit of uh, red cow, which traditionally, um, if one were to try to talk about where the cheese started from, um, it's believed that the red cow was the first cow um, used to mm. produce um, the, the cheese. Um, grana, we're bringing in different uh, types of pecorino, uh, Toscano, um, and then Telegio, Gorgonzola, uh, our fresh cheeses cover everything from uh, regular mozzarella that we're, um, so we're bringing in with, you know, being used with Italian cow milk uh, to bufala. Um, and Fontina, hmm. uh, um, yeah, I mean, pretty much everything under the Italian category we're producing um, and bringing in either in large format or our exact weights. Mm -hmm. So you're really sort of a one-stop shop for, for Italian. Yeah, I mean, again, that's, that's <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't really give you all the sales pitch, but that's really what we're trying to show and develop with our customers. You know, if, you know, there's no need to get some stuff here and stumps and some stuff there. And, you know, it, it was, it's, it's tough for people specifically in purchasing. Um, we work with distributors in this country. We also work directly with retailers um, that have the ability for us either to deliver to them or have the ability to come pick up from, we have a warehouse, um, in New Jersey and soon to open up a warehouse on the West Coast. But um, yeah, we want to be here in that one-stop shop. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, I'm just looking to see if we have any more questions that have rolled in, hold on. Okay, no, so yeah, there was one person that was asking a, a separate question about how the, how the cheese arrived. You never know how it's going to arrive when it goes through the mail. So. Well, it, you know, it, it, it's interesting. So the majority of all the cheeses that are like our aged cheeses, our hard cheeses, come with a maximum shelf life of a year. Um, we're bringing 90%, 95% of all of our products are coming um, over via boat. Um, we're bringing in containers on a weekly basis, but basically um, <laughs> we had a really fortunate experience to where these past few years since the tariffs kind of started hitting going into 2020, we kept really tight inventory. So typically if we were to start working with the customer, we would ask for, you know, three months worth of forecasting or what have you. And we would just always try to keep enough product on hand for what they were going to be needing on a weekly or, or monthly basis. And if we're starting a new customer, we would say, hey, you know, our lead time for that first order could be five weeks. Um, now tariffs have dropped, fortunately. Hopefully they will not come back. Um, the demand is gone, you know, through the roof basically now because you've lost 25% of, of that cost and we're now competitive specifically against domestic cheeses again. Um, so we, you know, and I think a few of you all out in the industry right now are experiencing the whole um, shenanigans with, you know, containers coming into this country being delayed and having the, all these issues. So we did a really cool thing as well, where we started bringing in a lot more inventory um, than we have a home for. Uh, but basically that's really helped us a lot being able to take on new customers and or match the demand that has been coming our way, which has been, been great. But so again, boats takes about five weeks from when we purchase till when it gets here and lands, obviously air um, every two weeks, but hopefully another few weeks we'll go back to being available each week. Awesome. So um, as I mentioned, the full hour has already flown by. So here's your chance to say goodbye. Yes. So say goodbye. 
Um, thank you all for coming to culture, counterculture. We miss you all. We can't wait. Yeah, that's right. We're all going to do crazy hand waves now. Um, and, <laughs> um, and I can't wait to see you all. You're getting a lot of, of thank yous. And Grana Padano versus Parmigiano, Parmigiano Reggiano has now been finally explained to people. So well cool. done. Cool. We've all learned something. Thank you. Well, guys. Thanks so much for the opportunity. And again, yeah, we can't wait to see you all. And, you know, I encourage everyone out there to, if they need samples, if they're wanting to see other cheeses, we, we love sending stuff out. So you know where to find me or you can know where to find me. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.